problems are piling up at our ports. C.H. Robinson, one of the world's largest shipping logistics companies, looking to address this supply chain crisis. The company handling about $26 billion worth of goods every year for companies like Walmart and Target. Joining me right now is the CEO of C.H. Robinson, Bob Biesterfeld. And, Bob, it's great to have you this morning. Thanks so much uh, for your attention to this. And uh, we uh, are watching your better than expected quarterly numbers as well. First, assess the situation for us, Bob. What are you seeing? Well, good morning, Maria. You know, the, the neat thing about Robinson is we work across the entire global supply chain. And, and candidly, there are opportunities for improvement at each step along the global supply chain. You know, I, I heard one of your guests earlier this morning say, you know, it shouldn't be that hard to unload a ship. And while that may be the case, that's only really one part of, of the solution is we've got issues with capacity on the ocean side. We've, you know, we're taking steps to keep ports open 24-7, which is a great first step. But that alone won't solve for the problem as we have downstream challenges with things like chassis availability, labor availability, driver shortages. And, and that really carries throughout the entire supply chain. Yeah, so what about that labor availability? We're talking so much about a shortage of truck drivers. Why are we seeing such a labor shortage? What can you tell us about the realities that you're faced with on the ground? Well, there is a shortage of truck drivers, and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least speak to some of the things that are going well in trucking, and that's the fact that we've got literally millions of professional truck drivers out on the roads every single day, safely delivering over 75 percent of all of the goods that all of us consume every day. But if we look across this landscape of professional truck drivers today, the estimate is that we're between 60,000 and 80,000 drivers short of what we need in order to just reach an equilibrium today. This is an industry that will likely need to add over a million drivers over the course of the next decade. And it's a challenging industry to attract labor into, given the, the demands of this, of this job. It's an incredible demanding dry, uh, job. They're driving all the time, and they uh, are sitting in that seat all, all the time. And that also is uh, disruptive for, for, for one's body. You are also investing in technology to move things along. What about that in terms of the impact on your company and growth with this investing in technology? How are you doing that? Well, yeah, so we'll spend about a billion dollars on technology over the course of the next several years. And much of that technology investment is geared towards solving just this problem, which is taking inefficiencies out of the supply chain. If we think about over the road trucking as an example, close to 25% of all of the miles that these trucks drive are driven empty without cargo, without a load. And we believe that we've got the ability, because we've got more truckload freight than anyone else in the industry, to really effectively match that, that supply and demand more effectively to, em to take those empty miles out. And every empty mile that we can take out is essentially incremental capacity that we're adding back in to help goods flow even more effectively through the supply chain. Really great and interesting uh, story. Let me get James Freeman in from The Wall Street Journal. Go ahead, James. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Bob, can you tell us, when we're talking about the problems uh, at the ports at Los Angeles and Long Beach, are there California-specific regulations that are affecting this in terms of uh, vehicle regulation, employment law that uh, results in in fewer truckers or fewer trucks than would otherwise be the case? You know, it's hard to tell if the state regulations are having a direct impact on the supply chain. What I can say for certain, though, is that the bottlenecks related to things like chassis availability is a huge thing that we need to solve for. And what's happening there today is as containers come out of the ports on chassis, they're going to be unloaded at, you know, retail distribution centers or other, other distribution centers. And because of the labor delays that exist there, those chassis aren't turning as quickly. They're spending much more time waiting to be unloaded, which again pulls you know, inefficiency into the supply chain and takes fluidity down. Fortunately, we've seen some improvements in the rail service as some of the rails have embargoed uh, uh, ch container ships or containers outbound. That's helped to, to ease some of the congestion at inland ports. So we should start to see more containers flow via the rail more effectively. But there's several more steps that'll take to work this out over the course of the next several months and even quarters. 
What, what about costs? Your company saw a price greater than cost of transport in the, in the truckload uh, for the first time in nine quarters. Tell me about the cost and what you're facing in, in terms of the expense side of the business. Yeah, it's, it's certainly been an inflationary cost environment, really in every mode. I mean, Ocean is probably the most uh, pronounced on a year-over-year -year basis, where we're seeing containers that perhaps a year ago might have been moving for a few thousand dollars are now moving in the tens of thousands of dollars from, from Asia to Long Beach. On the domestic trucking side, we've seen significant increases in the cost of purchase transportation over the past several quarters. Um, it did moderate a bit in the third quarter as we're starting to see pricing in the marketplace start to level out, albeit at much higher rates than we were at a year ago. But we do expect that there will continue to be some inflationary costs in the, in the trucking side. You know, in our industry, we talk about the spot market and the contractual market. And the spot market continues to, to move ahead of contracts, which typically tends to bring pricing up over time. Uh, I'm going to bring Alex Sanchez in, in a second. He's uh, from the Florida Bankers Association. But, Bob, before that, you just said something so compelling that you are looking or uh, we may sh be short 60 to 80,000 truck drivers. What, what is the salary, the average salary for those truck drivers? And, and where do you find the labor uh, in the face of these shortages that we're seeing across the country and in some cases the world? Well, I mean, professional truck drivers, depending on how they how they drive, if they're owner operators or if they're company drivers, if they drive single or drive team, that wage really, really varies. But I'd say if you think about kind of the mid $50,000 range, that's kind of probably a good average. In terms of where the labor comes from, there's, there is a solution there. And there's a couple of things very specifically. And the first thing that I would point to is that, you know, women make up about 47% of the labor pool today, but they only make up about 8% of the population of professional truck drivers. And so there's a real opportunity to attract women into this industry in a safe way and to, to, to drive more employment there. The second piece that I would talk about is, you know, bringing younger workers into the, into the interstate trucking. Today, you need to be 21 years old in order to be an interstate truck driver to drive from state to state. So if you think about the very nature of that, it's very difficult for trucking to be someone's first job, say, out of high school. So perhaps they have to go work in a different trade for a period of time, or they go to college for a bit, and they kind of fall into trucking as a second choice. So the Drive Safe Act, mm. which is a very important piece of legislation, is working to allow 18-year-olds to uh, obtain interstate truck driving licenses so that we can drive workers into this as a primary choice versus a secondary choice. Yeah, this is an issue that came up just yesterday on the Hill that lawmakers were, were talking about. Uh, and it's funny that you bring it up as, as being as important. Uh, yeah, Alex Sanchez is uh, here with us. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Maria. Bob, you know, you, you know, you're a great example why the free enterprise system is going to figure this out, you and your company. And, and I think we will. And uh, your company will help in, in getting those solutions. My question to you, Bob, is uh, to follow up on Maria's point to you. You said up to a million new drivers in the coming years. Obviously, as you just stated, you're going to have to recruit where you perhaps have not recruited before. What's the outlook and, and what kind of efforts do you can you share with us so that we'll know that uh, the solutions are forthcoming. Where do you see recruiting new, new truck drivers uh, down the road uh, uh, for the industry? Well, as I said, I think, you know, the industry associations like the American Trucking Association, the Owner Operators Independent Drivers Association, and companies like C.H. Robinson are actively working to try to make trucking a more attractive job, right? And in order to do that, there's things that we need around better infrastructure and reducing the bottlenecks that occur in the supply chain. We need more things like truck parking so that drivers feel safe and they're able to maximize their, their full day. And we need to ensure that our, our shippers and our receivers are treating truck drivers uh, ethically and fairly and providing a good environment for them to, to, you know, arrive to a distribution center, be treated with respect, unload the cargo and get on to their, to their next job. You know, our, our role at C.H. Robinson is we aggregate a, a network of about 75,000 different motor carriers, enable them with technology, and allow them to participate in freight that oftentimes they wouldn't be able to achieve on their own because of the lack of, of technology or ability to integrate with large shippers. And so there's a lot of things that as an industry we're working to do to, to attract drivers, and, and we typically tend to work with the smaller carriers. Yeah. Bob, Bob, real quick, have you seen a big change in the macro story? Have things slowed down from your standpoint? 
things are only picking up, honestly. You know, we continue to see really, okay. really strong demand signals from, from the consumer side, and the supply chain continues to be constrained. And so the market conditions that we're experiencing today, I, we really expect to play forward for the next several quarters. Bob, it's great to get your take on all of this. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Maria. Have a great day.